Jesus. As they begin to play, just real softly, we're going to stand and we're going to pray before service starts. Sister Gladys Pinnock is in need of healing. Sister Martha Hawkins is in need of healing. Brother and Sister Huffstetler is in need of God to touch them. Brother and Sister Kelvin Coffey is in need of God to touch them. Sister Shambaugh, Brother Steve Kasner, Sister Dawn Kasner, and Brother and Sister Garland, Sister Stewart, and Connie Brucker is in need of healing today. Sister Alma Akers is in need of salvation and healing. Or excuse me, is in need of healing. Connie Brucker is in need of salvation. We're just going to go to God in prayer, asking God to have his way. We're going to pray for Brother Richie today in the islands, in Windward Islands, that they would have revival in the spirit. I felt a burden for them and felt a burden for Ryan Thompson this morning in prayer. And I'm asking you to go with me before God that you would lift up their name in prayer today. Let God have his way in our service. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your spirit that's here. The glory of the Lord is in this house and we believe that you're here to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. There's no one quite like you, oh God. There's no one quite like your spirit. We ask you to have your way in this place. Every prayer request that's been made known unto us, God, we bring before the throne of grace. We boldly come before that throne of grace by grace. Heal Sister Husteller today. Continue the work you've begun in her. Heal Lord Brother Husteller today. Continue the work you've done in him. We pray for the Windward Islands, Lord. I pray revival in the spirit of the Lord to be with them every single service, every single church. God, that goes before the glory of God. I pray for Brother Thompson and those works in Brazil, Lord, with the Alviars. Let there be an anointing that would destroy the yoke. I pray in the name of Jesus that revival would begin to hit us worldwide. Let the anointing of God touch us today. Heal these inner sick, God. Let there be a breaking, God. Let there be a breaking. Touch Sister Hawkins today. Touch Sister Tina Coffey today. Touch Brother Kelvin and Sister Misty today. Touch Sister Dawn and Brother Steve today. We pray. We got a little bit of a higher side. We got a little more in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus lift it up Lord before you only you can do it only you can make a way where there's been no way we thank you for it we praise you for it in Jesus holy name Jesus, holy name. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Let's bless the Lord this morning as we go before his Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. And worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I worship your holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. I worship his
shall be your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to Sing your praise and strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending hallelujah ten thousand years then forever your name. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. Oh, worship Lord, 
This morning, he's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, God. God, we worship your name. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy, God. Everyone 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're in this place this morning and you've been standing in need of something, I wonder if you couldn't just begin to call out the name of Jesus. Because when his presence is here, everything has to change. Every, every bit of hell comes at attention. Every situation in your life has to perk up its ears and listen when the king enters the room. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 I wonder if we couldn't one more time lift our hands in the sanctuary to a holy God, to a God that loves us, to a God that loves us. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love the Lord this morning. I'm thankful to be in his house. Hallelujah. Anybody thankful to be in the presence of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. I can't think of any other place I would rather be than in the king's house. Then in the king's house this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're asking our ushers to come to get your offering out. Give us given unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Worship with us as we sing. You may be seated. You are marvelous, your glory is wonderful to me. Oh, what a great God you are. Oh, Lord, you are marvelous. Oh, you are marvelous, your glory is wonderful to me. Oh, what a great God you are. Oh, and we will praise you. Father of every generation, people everywhere, stand and declare he's a mighty God, a mighty God. Hallelujah, what a mighty God, what an awesome God. Oh, Lord, Lord, you are. Let us. 
truly awesome God. We serve a mighty God this morning. I wonder if we couldn't elevate our voices and elevate our praise to the King of Kings this morning. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to turn this service to our pastor. Excited to hear a word from the Lord this morning. I wonder if we couldn't give a hand clap of praise to the Lord as our pastor comes and takes this pulpit. We love you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God. What a great day to be apostolic. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's a lot of things going on in this world today, but it's really good to know the God of the world and not just want to know of Him or think you know of Him, but to know Him personally, intimately. It's good to know Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to preach to you today out of the book of Isaiah chapter 29 verse 16 first of all visitor thank you for being in the house of the Lord with us today I know you had to set your clock to get here and it's a purposeful thing for you to be here this morning because we have sprung forward I'm glad that there's something about spring in this house amen there might be snow on the ground but there's spring in our step and we're going to be able to serve the Lord with gladness I'm just going to go right into the presence of God Amen. Brother Adams gave me the pulpit, so I'm going to assume that I'm supposed to preach to you. Amen. And give you what the Lord has given unto me. Amen. If you've never experienced the oneness of God in Christ, or baptism in the only saving name which is under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12, there's not salvation in any other name. If you've never experienced that this morning, you're more than welcome to experience that before the night is over. Amen. Before this day is past. Within the last few weeks, we have baptized two people in Jesus' name, and two people received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I'm excited to tell you that this is not just for somebody a long time ago. This is for somebody today. It's not just for somebody that used to be. It's for this, this church today is on the move. It's not a happenstance or a has-been. It is a right-now apostolic demonstrative church. We still believe that healing virtue flows, and we still believe in the miracle power of our God, and we still believe that even though we might be deprived an hour of sleep, there's still something that God wants to do in this place this morning. He's going to show up and show out. Amen. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. This is a very wonderful passage of Scripture, but it's a very unique passage of Scripture. Surely your timing of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work, of, for shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? He had no understanding. I want to preach to you today on the subject, the master and the making. The master and the making. Jesus, I thank you that you're here today. I thank you that your spirit is here and you're speaking to us as a body. There is no one like you, God. I cannot compare anything to you, for you are undescribable. You are uncomparable, undeniably, God. We ask you to have your way in this place this morning. You already heard the cry of my spirit in my heart today. I'm asking you to show up, Lord, and show out in this house. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated. The time was an unclear time. 
even though God had spoken prophetically to Israel, yet somehow there was still not peace in the land. The people were scared of the Midianites. And one guy in particular was so scared that when our story opens and finds him, that finds him by a wine press threshing wheat. That's not the place you should thresh wheat, by a wine press. Gideon was scared. He was scared of the Midianites. The Bible says that he was so scared he was trying to hide from them, and he was doing it by the wine press, behind the wine press, threshing wheat. Because even though sometimes we don't know what to do, we do know that we have to do something, and that's where Gideon was at. I might not know what to do, but I know I can't quit now. And the Bible says that while he was by the wine press threshing wheat, that the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said these words. The Lord says, you are a mighty man of valor. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. After God makes a statement of Gideon's might, even though at the time everyone, even including Gideon, seen his weakness and his cowardice, even though Gideon himself knew that he was a nobody and he was so scared that he was stretching wheat behind the wine press, God calls him a mighty man of valor. Gideon answers like most of us, not with statements or even a decree, but he answers with a couple questions that are probably echoed in most apostolic churches and most Pentecostal homes today. His question is, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then? Is all this evil befallen us? If God's really on our side, why are we seeing so many devils that are fighting us on every side? And then the second question comes resounding. And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Number one, if God is with us, why are we seeing so much evil? Number two, if God is with us, where are the miracles we've heard preached about for years and years? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, Gideon said. But now has God forsaken us? He's delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. God's answer comes resounding back with an almost hilarious, overwhelming sound, totally ignoring the questions that was hurled in his face. And he says this, Go in this thy might, Gideon, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee, God says. Gideon argues back to God, as most of us do from day to day. His argument, once again, is not focused on the supreme power of the Creator nor the glory of the hand of God himself. But his argument is focused on the shortcomings of a little boy threshing wheat. He says, oh, my Lord, how am I going to save Israel? My family is poor from Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I'm going to tell you that time and time again, our answer back to God's supreme greatness and his prophetic utterance is not what it should be. But instead, we want to tell God how messed up our life is and how crazy it would be for him to use somebody like me. God, I'm the least among the Father's house, and I'm, I'm a nobody when it comes to the kingdom of God. But God's answer is brief and perfect right back to Gideon. He doesn't say, oh, you're right. I don't know what I was thinking about trying to use you. That's not the answer God gives. He doesn't say, you're right. You're a failure, and I don't know what I was thinking. You're not even rich. You can't do anything for God. No, that's not God's answer. But God's answer comes resounding back. Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Many of us, like Gideon today, we come to God with our shortcomings, and we argue that God, perhaps, life's events has caused us to doubt your divine will for our lives. Maybe we don't believe anymore that you could ever use somebody like us. Maybe we question the very reality that God could ever use someone as messed up as me but I've come to tell somebody in this building today that if you come with questions God has always got the answer much like Gideon we have doubted the supreme hand of God is it even at work in our lives at all some of us have come today with the asking and the questioning 
God, do you even know where I'm at? We, like Gideon, have stated, if God be for us, why then is all this evil befallen us? Why is it that we are in the middle of this statement called revival, yet feel less and less like we're on top of God's divine plan? We have done much what the prophet Isaiah said in our text this morning. We have looked at him who had made us, and we have questioned his makings. Yea, we have looked at him that has made us, and we have said, why have you framed me thus? I do not understand what I'm going through and why I have to go through it like I've went through it. I know sometimes the questions resound in our minds, and we do not always understand why God allows some things to happen to us in our lives. And we find ourselves questioning God from time to time. In this building Friday night, we heard this statement. We must never forget that the same God that is a storm calmer is also a storm causer. We must never forget that there is something that has to happen to our lives sometimes before God can ever use us in our lives. We must never forget something God told me over five years ago, that sometimes you have to go to prison on purpose. Everything cannot always be a free dance in the rain. Sometimes there's a storm that rocks our boat and shakes our world. And there is times that no matter our age, whether we're in the front few rows as a young person or whether we're on our way out in our late, late, later years in life, that God has to put us in a place so that he can make us what he wants us to be in the first place. And I come to tell you that it is no mistake. God does not make mistakes, Gideon. Uh, you might feel like you're the least of your father's house, uh, but God has a will for your life. And you might feel like you're the least among the brethren, but God has a will for your life. And you might not be the richest person in this building, but God has a will for your life. Must we never forget that God has got his divine hand in this thing. And it's pushing us, and it's molding us, and it's making us... After his Paul walked into a town and this woman starts walking around after him. And she starts crying out something that is the fact and the truth. She says, These men are sent from God. They're of God. They're sent from God. We got to be careful. Not everything that cries, Lord, Lord, is going to make heaven. Not everything that casts out devils is going into heaven. I don't care how many, how many thousands of dollars you send some of these guys that claim to be on top of the game and they claim to heal the sick and claim to cast out devils. The Bible said not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And there will be many that say on that day, have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? Have we not done so many wonderful works in your name? And he said, I'm going to look at them and say, I never knew you. You better be careful who you're following following right now because there's people that's following after a lie and those that believe a lie will be I know I'm, I'm bucking up against the spirit of our day, but we don't need teachers having itching ears we need people that will stand on the truth and preach the truth I find it amazing what we shine up and try to call truth in this day. It's not truth just because it sounds good. It's not truth just because it looks good. And it's definitely not truth just because it draws a crowd. The only thing that can be proclaimed as the truth is that holy Bible in my hand. And if somebody gets a hold of that book and they preach any other gospel, Paul said if me or any angel from heaven comes preaching any other gospel unto you, let him be cursed. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost telling me right here, stay right here. We need to have an understanding that everything that says that they're Christian doesn't mean they're Christian. And we're not in a fight against Islam, we're a fight against falsehood. 
I said, we're not in a fight just against Islam or just against some Buddha man somewhere. We're in a fight against false doctrine. We got to be careful that we don't strain at gnats and swallow camels. Mm. Well, I'm going to quit. This lady's saying, man, these men are from God. These men are from God. And Paul seen a spirit in her. Her spirit, that spirit of divination, that spirit that was trying to act like she was one of them. But in truth, in the spirit of God, she was not one of them. And he turned around, he looked at her, and he said, I'm done with this spirit. And we're going to cast this spirit out right now in Jesus' name. Demons came crying out of her. And when they came crying out of her, there were some mad magistrates. Don't you be messing with our livelihood now. It's amazing how quick when preachers start messing with money. You start messing with money, people start bucking up, man. Don't you start messing with our money now. We, don't you get on our money. I'm not talking about giving right now. I'm talking about they was making a livelihood from this woman. And because they were making a livelihood, they thought everything had to be okay. Man, this got to be good. It's putting money in our pockets. Everything that puts money in our pockets is not always a blessing from God as we heard Friday night. And so here we are at this point where Paul says, you know what, I'm not going to stand for this. He casts this stuff out. They get mad. And they, they were, that was what was making them money. And the Bible says that they went to the, the Romans and they said, look, these people are troubling us. They're teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe. And the multitude rose up against them and they began to rip off their clothes and they began to beat them. Anybody know this story? Y'all usually like to dance about this story. Shout about this story. This is the, this is the story we know real well. This is the old Paul and Silas locked up in prison story. This is the prelude to the reality here. And so next thing you know, they're cast in the innermost part of the prison. They're put in feet fast in the stocks. They've been beaten. They've been hurt. And the Bible says that along about midnight, they prayed and they began to sing praises. It's not enough to just sing praises without prayer. It's not enough to have prayer without praises. Well, I'm, I'm preaching today. They prayed and they sang praises unto God. And as they began to sing praises unto God, the Bible says that even though they were in prison, God had a plan for their life. Anybody hearing me this morning? Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that sometimes God puts you in prisons on purpose that you ain't supposed to? You ain't supposed to every un understand every little thing that goes on in your life. Sometimes you got to just step back and say, God, I don't understand where I'm at right now, but I trust you anyway because you are the author and the finisher of my faith. So we begin to see as God begins to speak to Paul and Silas, the earth begins to shake. The prison doors begin to open. And everyone, everybody say everyone. Everyone's band is loose. And the keeper of the prison wakes up. And he runs in and he thinks everybody's going to be gone. Let me tell you something, friend. I got news for you. If today there was an earthquake in one of our maximum security prisons and all the doors swung open and everybody's bands fell off, it wouldn't take but five to ten minutes for us to have a prison break. Because the automatic reaction to being bound up is that when you feel like you might be free, you want to get out of Dodge. Baby. They should have just busted out of there. But no, God had them there on purpose. And when the jailer comes walking in, the jailer sees everybody still in their place. He was getting ready to kill himself, but he's seen everybody's still there. Nobody's walked out. Nobody's went home. Nobody's went to their wife's house. Nobody's walked away and tried to get on a ship. Everybody's still there. And so he says, man. What's going on? And he begins to get convicted. And Paul and Silas begin to preach to him the gospel. And as the gospel begins to be preached to him, he said, man, I need, I need to be baptized in Jesus' name. What do I need to do? I got to get this. I got to get this for myself. You'd think that after the baptism, everybody could leave. But no, God keeps them in prison on purpose. See, y'all... We shout over the jail breaking open, but the reality is, is nobody left. Because they were there on purpose. 
Matter of fact, the jailer was ready to let him go, man. He's a Christian now. Let's get the people out of Dodge. I don't want you dying. Paul said, I am not leaving. I'm staying here. I'm going to stay right here because God's got me here for a reason. When's the last time you had the understanding? I'm not leaving this tribe. No, 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 no. Pastor's preaching crazy today. Who ever heard such a thing? Staying in a trial. Who ever heard of that? Some of us have went through such a sickness and infirmity attack lately that the least little thing comes along makes us think that we might be getting over our sickness. We're ready to get out of Dodge. Never one time has anybody stopped to ask, God, why do you have me in this position? There's been more questions about God. If you're for us, then why has all this evil befallen us than anybody saying, God, maybe there's a reason. Maybe I'm here on purpose. Maybe, maybe you're the storm causer and not the storm calmer in this instant. I was praying Friday night before I ever heard that statement come across the airwaves. And I say to you today, it is not a matter of whether God was going to let them out of prison. But how long would they be willing to stay in prison? Nobody likes this kind of message. That's why it keeps getting quieter and quieter. Paul, this great man of faith, this relentless revivalist said this. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing. I sought the Lord three times and I asked him to take it from me. And this is what he said. My grace. Is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, I'm going to glory in my infirmities, and I'm going to make sure that the power of Christ can rest upon me. How am I going to do it through my infirmities? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, What was it about Paul that he wanted to be removed from his flesh? That he really wanted to be able to do without? No one really knows. Theologians speculate. Perhaps it was disease. Perhaps it was something else. So let me submit to you a theory. Since nobody knows what he was trying to get removed, let me submit to you a theory. Could it have been prison? Think about this for just a second. Paul, the man with the plan. No man in history has impacted the church like Paul has impacted the church. Nobody has had quite the revival that Paul had for the Bible says the entire continent of Asia. That's a pretty big hunk of chunk of land, baby. The entire continent of Asia. Literally every single person there heard the gospel preached, was touched by Paul's ministry, had aprons sent to their houses, healing, virtue, and flow, and God was doing great things all over Asia. Paul, this missionary, this man that makes most of us look stupid when it comes to evangelizing and missionary and taking care of God's work and his plan, this man God chose to put into prison. I don't know about you, but I'm a stir-crazy individual. I know none of you get this problem, but I am. You put me in a room for too long, baby, I'm ready to get out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, when I pray, I walk, man. I can't even hardly sit still when I pray because I, I just have something in me. I want to go. I want to get it done, man. It's just, I don't know if it's the Margaret Diane in me or the Jerry Jean in me, but something in me makes me want to get going, baby. Let's get out of here. Come on. Anybody like me in the house? I know some of y'all like to sit around, but I, I want to get going. Let's do this thing. I like to have church and go home. You know what I'm saying? If we're going to have a move of God, let's have it. Let's have it right now. Let's not sit here for two hours and wait on God to move. Let's let God move now. That's why my services are all streamlined, probably too much so, because I don't want to come in here and talk about your neighbor's cat. That's not in my agenda. My agenda is let's have a move of God and let's go home.
agenda. I like to go, go, go. And I know Paul, I can imagine he was just like, he wants to go. He wants to get it done. He wants to see what God's going to do next. His moving is his glory. He's wanting to just get in the glory of God. Let it, I'm talking about a guy that as he walked around, he's seen people raised from the dead. I'm talking about a guy that literally was under persecution and was fine with it because he knew God had him right in the divine will, in his divine plan. This guy, God, this guy that was evangelist so much, a missionary so great that he evangelized continents, literally changed worlds, turned cities upside down. This guy, God decides to put in prison. Talk about a thorn in my flesh. I'd be saying, now listen, God, I think I could do more work out here on the street, you know. I, that's my ministry. I'm a street minister. I want to be out. I want to do work. I want to get on ships. I want to go places. God said, no, Paul, I'm going to put you in prison. The question would resound, why did God have to put Paul in prison? And I think it's simple. If God didn't slow Paul down, there would be no church government. There would be no revelation of government in the church. There would be no knowledge of how to run a building, of how to manifest offerings. There would be no knowledge of the gifts of the Spirit. What does it take to be in the gifts of the Spirit? Why would you have to have the love to have the gifts? There would be no knowledge of how authority works or what it's supposed to work. There would be no pecking order in the authority of the church. All of that was set in order because Paul was forced to go into prison. Paul was made to slow down long enough. He was made to do something long enough, set still long enough to make sure he could write letters to the churches. Over half the New Testament comes from a prison cell. I promise I'm going somewhere. Please hang with me. Gideon's resounding statement, if you are for us, why is all this evil befallen us? The question of the Israelites, if God is so powerful, why can't he just squash the Egyptians and let's get out of Dodge? Why do we have to borrow things on our way out of town? Look, we look like a bunch of beggars going to these people's houses saying, can we borrow some gold? Can we borrow some brass? Can we borrow some this and some of that? We look like a bunch of beggars. But God knew that there was no shepherd that was going to go out and learn how to be a miner in the desert. And he said, I got to have a tabernacle plan. And without gold, I can't build the tabernacle. You're going to have to borrow some things. There's a purpose and there's a divine plan that I'm putting you through. There's something you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to look stupid for just a little bit so I can look great in a long ways off. The fact that you are here today, the very fact that you showed up to this church this morning is showing that God is working in your life. For the Bible says you cannot even come except the Father draws you. He has to pull at you. He has to push you. He has to prime you. He has to try to grab you from where you're at. The very fact that you showed up here this morning, that you set your clock an hour early, and you made up in your mind, I'm going to get here, and I'm going to be a part of this service today. It's telling me that God's not finished with you yet. He is still pulling you. He is still forming you, and you are still on the potter's wheel. He's trying to make you into something. And always his hands doesn't work the same way. I'm sorry, but cups are not supposed to work the same way as pitchers. And pitchers are not supposed to work the same way as pots. And pots are not supposed to work the same way as a plate. Every one of them have a divine purpose. But only the master knows how to be the master craftsman and make them into what God is calling them to be. Sometimes he puts his hand in you and makes a handle and sometimes he leaves you flat so people can eat off of you but all of it has a divine purpose on the potter's wheel there's something about the potter's wheel though when the claim will not form to the potter's will it messes up on the potter's wheel and it goes to the potter's field so God said, I have a divine purpose for that. And we see in Jeremiah and in the New Testament that God used the 30 pieces of silver to buy the potter's field. The very thing he was betrayed with ended up buying the broken, rejected vessels in the potter's field. God loves rejects. He loves people that even won't form to his will. I don't know who you are today or why you're here. 
But whether you have formed to his every will and his every wish and his every whim, or whether you have fought against the prisons of your life, God is still in love with you. He loves you even when you make mistakes. He loves you even when you say no to his divine plan. And because of that, he said, I'm going to buy the rejected field, the field that nobody wants. I'm going to buy the field of the people that got off the potter's wheel too early or too late. And I'm going to make sure I can use them. I'm going to put them back in my hands. When you realize that God is pulling you and molding you into what he is calling you to be. And you stop fighting his hands. Then you have what is talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. He said we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together. Groweth into a holy temple unto the Lord. In whom we also built together for an habitation through the Spirit of God. A building fitly framed together. There's nothing about this building that looks the same. The stone is picked, but it's not the same. There's big stones, and there's little stones. There's fat people, and there's skinny people. There's prayer warriors, and there's not prayer warriors. There's Bible studies and theologians and there's people that barely know one scripture. But all of it has a place. This little stone seems insignificant. But it has a place in the wall. And so God said this building, when it's fitly framed together, when it's put upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. This is where God chooses to dwell. When people decide I'm going to stop fighting the will of God. And I'm going to start giving in to his will and his plan. God is perfected in you and through you. And when you realize that. He knows how to make a mighty man of valor. And you stop fighting his plan. And you become what he's called you to be. Mighty men know that God had to do this because it's for sure if I did it on my own, I'd have messed it up. Mighty women know that if it wasn't for grace, I don't know where I'd be today. Mighty men of God know that it was just a few days ago that I was such were some of you kind of moment. I was chief among the sinners. Mighty men of God's story will sound something like Gideon's story. When God comes to talk to you and knock on your heart, the answer comes resounding back. God, I don't think you know who you're talking to. You're calling me a mighty man of valor, but right now I feel like a coward. I'm over here hiding from even the very thought that there could be an enemy coming at me right now. God, I'm just this guy behind the threshing floor or behind the wine press just Pushing out the threshing floor, just trying my best to make a living. I I don't even want to be out there in the open. I don't want anybody to see me. And God said, no, I know exactly who you are, Gideon. I know what makes a mighty man. Gideon said, God, if you're for me, then why has all this evil befallen me? And why haven't I seen miracles? And God said, that ain't even in the equation. Get up and go in the power of your might. But God, you don't know, I'm, the ri- I'm not the rich like some of these others. I'm the poor house of Manasseh, and I, I'm the least among my brethren. I'm the, I'm the lowest of the low. And God says, no, you don't understand. It's not a matter of being rich. But God, Moses said, you don't know me. I'm a stutterer, and I don't speak real clear. And You're asking me to go say something to Pharaoh, and I can't even say nothing to myself. I stutter, I stutter whenever I talk. And God said, no, you don't understand. I got a job. I know. I know. The clay. <laughs> There's an old song. I, I've been waiting on my buddy Kelvin to get up and get here and be able to sing with me. I told him, I said, when you get back to church, we're singing this song. It's a, it says, the potter knows the clay, how much pressure it can take, how many times around the wheel to submit to his will. 
It's a beautiful design, but it will take some fire and time. Potter knows the clay. I'm telling you today that God can look at somebody that nobody else even wants to be around and see the potential in their spirit. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God can look at somebody that nobody else thinks has potential and see a preacher. If you're not with me right now, I've come to a place where one of the most powerful messages ever been preached, in my opinion, in the entire New Testament had just got done resounding. And it's altar call time, but instead of running to the altar, they're taking the preacher out of the church to kill him. I watch as this preacher looks towards heaven and sees a vision. And as he begins to prophesy and he begins to say, God, lay this not to their charge. This preacher, this unbelievable man of God that preached a message that many of us didn't even know some of the revelations he brought out of the Old Testament is in Acts 7. But if you look to the left or to the right, somewhere in the shadows, you'll find a guy holding coats. Picking up on a murderous spirit. That day was a launching pad, a catalyst, if you will, of killing Christians. He made up in his mind that day. Man, I like what I just seen. And now I'm not going to hold coats anymore. I'm going to become the killer. And he gets a decree from magistrates. And he goes around and starts pulling people out of churches and out of houses. And he starts killing them. He starts murdering them. And he's on his way to murder again when God calls him. God calls a murderer. A Christian murderer. Many of us wouldn't have thought twice because if somebody walked in here this morning, my God, somebody walked in here this morning with a headdress on that made them look a little different than us, and we thought just by happenstance they could happen to be a terrorist, many of us would have met them at the door. All of us gun toting Christians would have already had our guns, safeties unlocked. And God says, I see something else. Oh man, it's quiet in this house. <laughs> It might take a few prisons on purpose. It might take me putting them in the middle of the storm and the sea. I might have to rock their boat and get them to listen to me. I might have to make them blind before they really hear the voice of the Lord. But I've come to tell you, there's a preacher in that murdering man. There's a preacher that's going to preach the greater half of the New Testament. That's going to set up con constructional government in the church. That's going to be able to say, this is what the gifts of the Spirit are. And this is how they operate. There's a preacher coming and he's coming from a place nobody would expect but I know the clay you might not know the clay but I know the clay you might think all hope is gone but I know the clay Gideon's story will start just like Gideon's story started and a mighty man's story will end just like Gideon's story ends Questions will arise. Doubt will cloud our vision. But there will come a time in every mighty man and every mighty woman of God's life where like Judges 6 and 17 where we finish the story, he will say or she will say, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign. Talk with me. Don't leave. I was walking around here this morning praying before this service began. And the question that resounded in my mind is, God, if you're quiet to us now, how are we going to make heaven our home? David's statement, I said, I'd be like those that go down in the pit, was coming through my spirit. I said, God, if you don't do anything else today, I don't care if I preach fancy. I don't care if people like what I have to say. But please save somebody today. Pull somebody out of a hell's doorway. Take somebody from the burning flames and fire and let them be able to be saved today. I could care less if I entertain you this morning. I want to entertain God. And so I want God to be able to hear my voice. Lord, don't leave right now, I pray thee. That's what Gideon said. If I'm really your man, don't leave right now. Let me come unto thee. Let me bring a present to you and set it before you. And if I can make sure that you'll tarry long enough until I can do that, then I will know that you are God. And Gideon went in and he made 
a kid ready. I mean, I'm not, you're not talking about microwave dinners, baby. I said, you're not talking about microwave dinners. They're not talking about crock pot. I, before I left this morning, I, 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 I made sure that I put on a crock pot of barbecue ribs. Put it on slow. You're not talking about, he didn't have crock pot cooking already. He had to go in and prepare a kid. He had to take care of the goat, kill the kid. And whenever, whenever he got the kid ready, he had to make unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour and the fresh and the flesh he put in a basket and he brings the broth in a pot. So he's got a, bot, a pot, a basket, unleavened cakes and he brings it out under the oak and he presents it to the angel. And the angel of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. Can you imagine making all this stuff and you bring it out thinking I'm going to entertain the presence of God. Isn't it amazing that this angel never left? He was just waiting on Gideon to get back. Isn't it amazing that God never leaves because he wants to show you he means business? It's not God that you're waiting on, baby. It's your own flesh that you're waiting on. You don't believe that God loves you enough to take this broken, worthless vessel and make it something new again. You don't love God enough or you don't think God loves you enough. I don't know which one it is, but I come to tell you right now that God wants to use you no matter how messed up your life is. He's still waiting on you right where he told you he would be. Church, we're in revival. If you expect me to always preach to you, I don't know what, you're going to be bored the next few months because there's a soul harvest coming. I was praying this morning and I literally heard the marching of, of, of feet and I thought, my God in heaven, this revival's coming. I submit to you that there's prophecies that's been laid over this church. You ready? Don't get too excited. You hear me out. There's prophecies that's been laid over this church that said you cannot move into that building fast enough. And I wonder if God hasn't delayed some of these things on, and took it out of our hands from even being able to do anything because we're not ready yet. what devil's in your ear right now there's a revival in the apostolic movement and it's happening all around us I went to school with Bobby. If you, if you would have told me that Bobby would got the Holy Ghost in, a, in an apostolic youth service in Brazil that I was preaching, if you would have told me that when I was a senior, I would have called you a liar in front of everybody. But now not only has she got the Holy Ghost, but she's married to a backslider that is in need of an old-fashioned, anointed, refreshed touch from God. And if you think for one second that God's done in their life and in their marriage, you don't know the God that I serve. I I come to tell you, God is waiting on you right where you left him. Can you imagine doing all this work and then bringing it out and the angels say, oh, that's real good. I like that. Put that on the rock. Hold on a second. No. I spent a lot of time in the kitchen. You've been waiting on me. Let's eat, you know. I'm a little hungry. I've been looking at this goat. I've been looking at this unleavened cakes. I got this broth just right. I mean, baby, let's eat now. No, I'll pour it out on a rock. Man, God works weird sometimes. So he takes the flesh, puts it on the rock, pours the broth out on the rock, did everything the angel said. And the angel of the Lord puts forth the end of his staff that was in his hand. He touches the flesh, touches the unleavened cakes, and there comes a fire out of the rock, consumes the flesh, the unleavened cakes, which the Lord departed, or which the, then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. God was letting Gideon know, look, buddy, I'm just testing you to see if you're willing to offer up anything. I want to know how serious you are about this thing you're talking about. You hear this preacher, what makes a mighty man is not your finances financial status, your stature, or who you are in Jesus. What makes a mighty man is somebody that's willing to offer God their everything and do it with all of their might. 
When Gideon perceived this is an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord says to Gideon, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon, you ready? It's just getting ready to get good. Then Gideon built an altar there. What makes a mighty man is that off, after he offers up his life, he doesn't say, well, that's good enough, God. If you can't do something with that, I'm out of here. No. He says, I'm not only going to offer up my life, I'm going to offer up my everything. I'm going to build an altar. And he called the name of that place Jehovah Shalom, which is the first time we know God of peace. Jehovah Shalom is the God of peace. Gideon said, I know God in a level I've never known him before because I've been knowing the war and rumors of wars. Midianites are coming in all the time. I live in fear. I, offer, I, I operate my farm in fear. But now I have met the God of peace and the God of peace has told me that if I let him use me I can become Victoria why don't you stop trying to figure God out somebody in the sound of my voice today you are trying your best to figure God out stop saying to your maker why have you made me thus and start building your altar Preparing your offering. Say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it this time, but man, I sure have given you everything I know to give you. I tell you, this morning I had an old-fashioned prayer meeting. I know I'm probably a little over-exuberant for Sunday morning, but I had an old-fashioned prayer meeting this morning. I brought construction documents in here. I laid them on the altar. I did everything I knew to do. I said, God, I'm, I want you to know... I don't have anything else to give. I'm giving you everything I can give you because I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my home. I'm giving you my finance. I'm giving you everything. You ask for me of anything, I'll give it to you. Oh, that's over the top, preacher. Well, hang on just a second because you ain't going to like what's getting ready to be said. When I get done giving God everything I have, then God gives it all back to me and then some. God is just waiting on us to see if we'll be willing to give him everything. And then he makes something out of our nothing. What God is going to do in us and through us is going to blow some people's minds. I watched a pastor one time. He grabbed this young man out of the congregation. He said... You see this young man? I'm talking 4,000 preachers standing around. He said, you see this young man? He said, this is the only young man I've ever asked to leave my church. I got that quiet. This is the only young man I've ever asked to leave my church. Told him he wasn't welcome back. He said, he shot holes in our windows. He vandalized every inch of this property. He caused me so much problems. He said, finally, I looked at him and said, you are not welcome back to this church. He said, you see this young man? He said, guess what I'm getting ready to go do? I'm getting ready to go preach his dedication to his brand new building because he's pastor in a church. You ready? You hear me? There's people that we give up on. There's people we throw out in the pile and the heap and the dump and we say we don't want any part of that kind of person anymore. We kick them out of every part of our lives and we don't really want any part to do with them. There's people in the sound of my voice that you feel like that God has given up on you and you don't understand why you're in the prisons that you're in and you don't understand why you're in the places that you're in yet all the time you feel the tugging hand of God pulling you back to the throne of Calvary and telling you there's still hope for a tree and even even if it's been cut down, if it can smell the scent of water, it can live again. And I come to preach to you this morning. I know everybody in here has been bored, but you know I got your number. The master is making you and breaking you and taking you into what he wants you to be. Stop trying to figure God out. Start trusting God's hands. 
In closing, let this Psalm of David become our prayer today. Oh, Lord. Can I be myself right now? Can I preach the way I feel right now? Oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou even understand my thought afar off. Thou come past my, my path with my lying down, and thou art equated with all my ways. There is not one word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. For thou hast been behind me and before me, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot understand it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And how can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up in heaven, Lord, you're already there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, somehow thou art there. I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even now, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall uphold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, then the night becomes a light to me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou possess my reins, and hast covered me in my mother's womb. I want you to listen to these next few verses if you missed all the rest of that. You ready? I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. I'm a mess, God. Thine hands did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in the book that you have, all my members were written and in continuance were fashioned. And as yet, there's none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, God, they are more in the number than the numbers of the sands in the sea. When I awake, I am still with thee. Even when I sleep, I'm with thee. If I count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am with thee. If any wicked come my way, you will lead me in thy way everlasting. God is the master. And he is making you into what he needs you to be. You might see a storm, but God sees it as a catalyst of your faith. He sees it as a moment where you're supposed to step out on the waves. You're supposed to walk. You might see failure, but God sees a testimony. You might see a lost, hopeless life, but God sees a preacher. I speak in the name of Jesus Christ. I want every saint in here to tell me how far will God's mercy go. I'm not asking how far you're willing to give your mercy. I'm asking how far will God's mercy go. How far is God willing to bend over backwards to make sure that you still have hope? I know what it feels like to be on the broken piles of heaps knowing I have a call of God on my life. I know what it feels like. I was called as a child. I didn't know what to do with that calling. People made fun of it when I tried exercising it. People would laugh at me, but I had a burning desire to preach the gospel. And I pushed it off, and I made stupid choices, and I made dumb mistakes, and I got hung up on my own idiosyncrasies, and I allowed the devil to take me down roads of disappointment. And I know what it feels like to literally leave this building feeling like all oh, hope is gone. I know what it feels like to lay myself on the heap of hopelessness. I know what it feels like to have somebody literally pick you up and discard you because they know your past. I also know what it feels like to have the master 
reach down and grab that piece of junk and take it back in the potter's house and do what only a master craftsman can and make it again another vessel that seemeth good to the potter to make it I also know what that feels like I know what it feels like to know that although all hope seems gone there's still hope for me Lord that has searched me and known me yea you know my down settings and my uprisings you know my thoughts are far off I've preached for a long time God is wanting you to come and pray right now God is wanting you to admit Lord I'm nothing without you he is still standing here where you left him but you're going to have to admit God I don't know why <laughs> you would still love someone like me <laughs> but I will come and I will give you every part of my life again. I don't know why you would still want me. But I'll surrender to your will. The second person I'm preaching to. You've been in this building and you've been faithful. You've not failed God. But you have questioned him. Because you've been in prisons of purpose. And you don't understand why. And God has spoke to you this morning. He has had you there for a reason. He has put you there for a reason. I know my friend's listening this morning. I know he is. He told me he would be. But I told Brother Kasner this revelation a long time ago. I said, I said, Brother Steve, I said, I don't know why God's not healed you. But I do know this. If there's something God's wanting you to do while you're here, you better find it out. Because you don't want to come back to this place. If God's wanting you to write letters, you better send for the parchments. Hey, tell Mark. I need those parchments. He's profitable unto me and unto the gospel. Get him here because I need to start writing letters. Uh, send me an Onesimus. Send me somebody because I need to start getting some letters out there. And I need to start reaching the lost. There's somebody in the sound of my voice this morning that you have been going through it. I don't want you to wait on somebody else. I want you to say, God, if you can use anything, you can use me. I, I, I'll give you my all right now. I want this altar to be open as we stand, as the saints begin to pray a conviction prayer. I want you to just come to the front of this building and say, God, I've been in prisons on purpose, and I don't know why. Somebody in this building says, Lord, I've been feeling like a broken, worthless vessel, and now, now I need your strength. I need your help. I need your guidance. God, I don't understand why you would still want me. But I'll be used if you want me to. I'll build an altar here. I'll offer a sacrifice here. I'll do what you've called me to do. I'll be what you've called me to be. If you'll just be what I need you to be. God said, I'll make you a mighty man of valor. I'll make you a mighty man of valor. I'll make you a mighty woman of God. Saints, if you ain't praying this morning, will you come down and pray with those that are? Come down here and pray with those that are praying because this is a place of anointing. be a cry come out of our lips this morning let there be a cry come out of our lips Lord make me over make me over Lord say Lord make me over again make me over again say make me over again there is hope for me if there is hope for a tree I don't know why you haven't done what I thought you were going to do, God, but I trust you, and I'm going to find out what you have me here for. I don't know why I'm shipwrecked on an island. I don't know why I'm on the estuaries of the seas of my life, God, but I'm going to find out why, and I'm going to make sure I make most of it right now. The reason I'm here has got a purpose. I'm here has a purpose. Make me over again. Make me over again and again. Say, make me over again. Make me over again. Say, make me over again. Come 
on, preacher. Lay your hand on some of these people and pray for them right now. There's people up here praying, God, touch their bodies, their minds, their hearts, their lives. There's people praying through up here. Backsliders praying through to God. Let's lift our hearts to God right now. Let there be a cry come out of our lips. Don't let there be silent prayer right now. Let there be a prayer come out of our lips. God wants to hear our voice. Come on, sometimes the only way we can get into a place with God is to let a prayer come out of our lips. Let there be an effectual, fervent prayer. Let there be an effectual, fervent prayer. We need an availing, oh God, in the Spirit.
over this sanctuary from the front to the back, the east to the west. I wonder if we couldn't lift our hands one more time in his presence this morning. Thank him for the word that we've heard. God, we love you so much. Thank you, God, for putting us on your wheel, God. God, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. God never ceases to amaze me. Just when I think he doesn't know where I'm at, he shows me he's been beside me the whole time. 
Hallelujah. I love the Lord this morning. I love Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor, for preaching to us this morning. Service this evening, 6 o'clock, 5.30 will be prayer time right back here in the sanctuary. Looking forward to a great time in the Lord tonight. Revival continuing. Look around. Bring somebody back with you tonight. Invite somebody to church. Let's see if we can't fill the house up. Because God will be here. Hallelujah. God will be here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we march in dismissal this morning, giving in tithes and building fund, conference offering, if you'll march west side, east side, then the center section, we'll see you tonight. 530 is prayer time, 6 o'clock is service. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.